Good evening and welcome to 13 Now. I'm News 13's Amy Hoyt and we are coming to you live tonight from our studios in downtown Panama City. As you know, it's election season and we have been bringing you candidate forms for the local races uh, that are on the ballot this time for August 20th in our local primary election. And tonight is our fourth and final one. You will meet the candidates for Bay District Schools. It is seat one uh, with incumbent Jerry Register and his challenger, Whitney Nieves. We do want to remind you that early voting has started, but you still have plenty of time through the 17th, and then Election Day is the 20th. We'll talk a little bit more in detail about where you can cast your ballots. But first, we'd like to introduce both of our guests, um, our incumbent, Jerry Register. Good to see you. Thank you both for coming out. And his challenger, Whitney Nieves, who is on my right, your left. And we're (laughs) going to start with opening statements in alphabetical order. Miss Whitney, you go first. Hi. So... Thank you for having me here today. Uh, My name is Whitney Nieves. I'm running for school board district one. Um, Small background on me. I ended up here because my husband retired out of Tyndall Air Force Base. Um, This seemed like a great place to call home. So we chose to do it and finally set some roots. Um, I have two children in Bay District Schools. My youngest is entering uh, kindergarten this year. My oldest is going into high school. Um, I have an education of I have a plethora of, of degrees, but uh, my educational background specifically with regard to my master's is in education and public health. I'm big with uh, community activism, educational activism. Um, after being here for two years and kind of assessing and and getting a feel for it and hearing what others um, thought about the school district, I thought I would kind of step in, try my hand at promoting a better quality of education for the students. Um, I, my platform really focuses on the teachers student success and the community at large and getting the community back into the schools and involved. All right. Thank you, Mr. Register. Well, thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. In the last 50, almost, almost the last 50 years, I've been in education in Bay County. I have had the opportunity to do so many things. I want to talk about from the gamut what what I have done. My first teaching experience was at Everett Junior High School. During that year, I happened to reacquaint myself with a young lady uh, in first, I had in first grade back at Oakland Terrace, my wife. We got married that year, and we've been married 54 years, and I continued at Everett. She came with her principal, John May, the next year. Uh, we've continued working there together at Everett for three years. We went back to graduate school. Uh, after graduate school, we came back to Everett, and uh, I, after that one year, I went to Springfield for, for some uh, elementary experience while my wife went to Gulf Coast and she taught there for 35 years. Then uh, after Springfield, I went to Lynn Haven for two and a half years, continuing with education in elementary. And then I went and began my administrative experience at Northside for two and a half years. And then I went for 11 and a half years at Southport as principal. It was nine years before I ran for school board. I want to talk about five highlights of school board. Number one, uh, wow, we had uh, we had a real problem with the hurricane. Then we had a problem with uh, uh, not enough money. We had to close and repurpose schools. We had COVID. We also had all other kind of things that occurred during those years. Uh, I am so proud of our district. I am proud to have been there for almost 50 years. All right. Thank you, Mr. Register. On to the questions. Bay District Schools has changed a lot over the years, especially since Hurricane Michael. We've repaired campuses, built new schools. Some had had to be closed down. What's your priority if you're elected on August 20th for campuses and facilities? Ms. Nieves? I would like to see something happen with Rutherford. Um, I've I've worked in schools that were designed to be middle school, high school. Um, I know ones exist, you know, like up at, uh, in Southport, K through 12. If we're going to keep them together, it needs to be designed to work that way. Um, we, so the way I emphasize this is I'm, I'm just a person who decided to run for school board and the amount of people who have reached out to me with concerns from, uh, from all over the county um, is a little, a little concerning on one hand, but then also it's enlightening. Um, So I've heard the same, I guess, kind of narrative over and over again about Rutherford. So another example I'm going to give is um, it's PCS season. We have a lot of families coming in. Hey, Tyndall's full. We're looking to buy or, hey, we're zoned for Rutherford. What can I do? The amount of families who don't 
want to go to Rutherford is disheartening. I know a lot of the staff there who love it. I know kids there who are you know, under service. That doesn't mean that they don't deserve the absolute best. It's a problem that we see nationwide with inner city schools. They're routinely always left out of the equation when disaster hits, or even if not, they're just left out. I went to a Title I school growing up, and I found out last year that that was the school that they chose to close. They just didn't want to fund it anymore. So I would really like to focus on the underserved areas. All right, Mr. Register. Oh, thank you. I think our facilities department has done a wonderful job meeting the needs of our children. I want to talk about one issue, M.K. Lewis. When several years ago with a previous superintendent, when we first came on in, I think, 2008, he and I thought we need to do something to M.K. Lewis. We need a state-of-the-art school. I agreed wholeheartedly. And you know what happened? We had problems with money. You know, we had problems with COVID. We had the, the hurricane. We had some difficult times. And I will tell you, I am so sorry that we don't have a new school for M.K. Lewis. The first meeting I had with the superintendent, I talked with him about M.K. Lewis. He agreed wholeheartedly. That's what we have to do. Folks out there with uh, in, in M.K. Lewis, please hear me. We talked about where we could put it. I suggested maybe at the Everett campus. Well, it's coming down, we know, because of FEMA. Uh, the superintendent wants something, a place more in central, in the middle of the county. I don't have a problem with it. I will say this. We're going to make sure in these next four years we have a state-of-the-art M.K. Lewis school. How do you feel about the dress code policy? There's been some confusion this year with what kids can or cannot wear to school. Do you think it matters what children wear when they go to class each day, and what would you do differently? Mr. Register? Uh, I, I don't think we have a problem with the dress code per se. I just think that everyone, every administrator, everyone within the schools have to follow the guidelines. We have to find the guidelines. I don't have a problem with uniforms in the future or whatever. But I think we all have to do the same thing. One of the things I do is I do visit all schools every semester, and then I go back more times. And I do see sometimes where kids are wearing things they shouldn't be wearing. And I think we need to uh, kind of go back and make sure we're following what the policies are and doing what we're supposed to do for kids. That is with the dress code. How do you feel about it? Um, so I think the dress code, if enforced, is a, it's a valid dress code. I uh, was at my son's um, MAPS orientation a couple of days ago now, and they said it perfectly. Um, what was it? It was like the four Bs, the, the, the breasts, the butts, the biceps, like don't show it. Um, it. I think it does. It comes down to enforcement. They seem like they're on top of it. They're going to really enforce that, among other things, um, this year. It, it can be distracting. It really can be. I don't have any issues with uh, graphic shirts. And that's one thing I think we should maybe be more specific about just because of the culture of today's, you know, teens and wearing anime and stuff. Um, if the shirts maybe should be vetted individually. It shouldn't be so, we well, can just have a little logo in secondary. Um, I, I find those to be harmless and kids learn when they're comfortable, right? But I think as long as uh, it's appropriate, it's not showing too much, not, you know, it's covered. You're semi-professional. You're there to learn. That's what should matter. Do you think the principal at each individual school should have their own say for their campus? Um, I think they reserve that right, yeah. So that was one thing that they talked about at Mosley. You know, they didn't really hit on the graphic shirts, per se. That was the way it came off to me in the orientation is those will be taken into account should something arise. So if it seems inappropriate, if it seems offensive, they'll handle it. Um, with that, with that extent, yeah, I, th I think they should have a say so, but also I'm pretty confident that the admins want their students to dress, dress appropriately. What do you think about that? I disagree. I think that what's good for one school is, is good for another. If a student moves from Bozeman to, uh, let's say Arnold, I think they ought to see the same dress code. I th our problem is we've got to follow the guidelines. We have to go by what the policy is. Are you happy with the policy, though? What we have now, what they can yes. wear and not wear? Yes. Okay. No problem. All right. One of the amendments on the ballot in November is about uh, changing to a partisan school board because now you run as NPA, no party affiliation. Mm -hmm. um, that was changed in 1998. 
Um, If this passes, it would make district school board elections partisan uh, starting in 2026. And so my question is, how do you feel about that? And are you willing to tell us tonight how you're registered to vote? Yes, I don't mind. I'm a Republican. And uh, I think if we're going to continue having the superintendent as partisan, I think the school board needs to be partisan as well. Uh, I think the Republican Party has different values than the Democrat Party have, has, and I think it goes that uh, I'm glad to be a Republican. I'm glad I'm a conservative, and that's the way I look at the school board and our parents who we uh, listen to all the time. How do you feel about Ms. Nieves? Um, well, I don't suppose I can not answer this question. I'm a registered Democrat. Um, this is nonpartisan, and I will say I don't appreciate Um, comments like that or questions like that in such a hostile environment here lately. Um, So short answer, when uh, 2008, I, you know, that was when Obama was being elected. And I remember asking my family, hey, what are we registered as? And the first thing my mom said is, we're Democrats because we're poor. So this is, um, I guess, what I learned to be the Southern Democrat. But the people I have met here um, haven't given me any reason to want to sway or or change. Um, I am who I am along the way. I pick values from that I relate to across the board. I think that's what makes us unique. Um, Because of the hostility and the fact that we are dealing with children's education, um, my national views have nothing to do with how I am as a teacher. And I know a lot of teachers who are Democrats or independents here in the county, um, same thing with admin. And I don't know that we need to be so divisive with the state of hostility right now when all we're trying to do is help students succeed. Hostile meaning who's hostile? You don't mean right here. No, not here in the county. Um, just blatant attacks from the party I'm not affiliated. One of the parties I'm not affiliated with for no real reason except I'm a Democrat. But if you win in two years, you'd have to declare. So are you willing to face that? Like it, if it if this passes in November, it'll have to become partisan. Right. Yeah. Yeah. If it passes, well, yeah. I mean, I just I just don't think there's room for partisanship when we're dealing with kids' lives, when we have a military background, kids of all kinds of worldly experiences, and it's just, it feels so embedded and ingrained. And I didn't, I'm not doing this for politics. Um, I, I said this once the other day, sometimes I wonder, had I known then what I know now about how cruel people are being, I don't know if I would have done it. I'm glad I'm doing it. I'm glad that I'm showing other people that they can serve their, their, their community and that their time is valuable too. But it's very, 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 very disheartening to hear from people these cruel remarks, this blatant slander, especially groups that are supposed to be supporting kids and teachers. Any comments? Yeah, I, I would like to. You know, Jerry Register has not attacked my opponent. No, I promise no, no, you. no. I have never, I've never said anything ugly to her. No. I want her to run her campaign like she wants to. I'm going to run mine like I want to. Other people may say what they want to, but hey. I will not be ugly to anyone, much less my opponent. Yeah, no, Mr. Register hasn't been, um, but you mean you're speaking in generalities? The, it's, it's, the, the it's the geo, it's the Republican Party here, and just to be blunt, um, just absolutely, it's, it's it's horrific. It's, that what's what's really interesting then, Amy, is <laughs> what she's leading up to is I was endorsed by the Republican Party the Moms for Liberty, and also the realtors here, and Mr. Jimmy Patronus. I'm really proud of that, and I hope I don't disappoint them. Is that it's, a problem? No, it's not about endorsements. Um, oh, all right, so we're on the air. So any teacher watching can relate. Um, any educational pathway, we look at educational philosophers. Um, there's a lot of Marxists, that's a trigger, trigger word, um, ingrained in it. And I wrote a piece, and I quoted... Paulo Freire, Freire um, because he believes that teachers and everyone believes, everyone knows this, the districts want parental involvement, right? That students succeed when when there's a, a like a relationship built between the classroom and the parents. And the amount of slander and just absurdities that came from that in effort to, you know, garnish votes for Mr. Register is ridiculous. And it's not just me. I can promise you any teacher throughout the nation who's studied childhood psychology or sociology has looked into these philosophies. No, I'm not a Marxist. I get emails telling me that, God, that uh, my communist family is trying to destroy the nation. And I kindly remind them that my husband served two decades 
to reserve his right to tell me that. And it's, it's just really disheartening. All I'm trying to do is help kids succeed. I don't disagree with anything really that half the people that half of the questions they hit me with, uh, you know, Moms for Liberty, when they talk about teaching gender ideology. No, absolutely not. It just really seems to come back down to because I'm a registered Democrat. And it's, it breaks my heart because my kids, this is the world they're going to grow up in. Let's talk about parental involvement. It's very important. It always was when we were kids growing up. It is still now, but times have changed. Um, you got a lot of single parent families or mom and dad are working maybe full time job or two two jobs and they can't always get to meetings. What is the protocol if there's a problem with your child's school and at what point do you go to the school board? Well, let me tell you this. A parents, parents call me or text me or email me about a problem. And I've tried to steer them to the right source. Like this week, just a couple of times, I called the district office and had some people call them. I think parents, when they're serious about a situation, we have to listen. We have to find the appropriate people to answer their questions, to try to get their students back on the straight and narrow and doing well in school. How important is uh, parental involvement? It is really involvement. Ideally, in a perfect world, parents would be on board on top of their kids' education. Um, I know my mom was involved in spirit, I guess. You know, she didn't graduate high school. She worked multiple jobs, um, did a lot just to support my sister and I. So she, her want to be involved, it, it transpired in other aspects of my life. Um, and I've known, you know, I, I've mentioned this to someone earlier that going from my undergrad program to my graduate program, how much had just changed so drastically when we look at, um, you know, parental involvement and the things that are going on in the community with kids that we teachers are like mentors or therapists or social workers. We, I mean, we literally go through a little bit of all of these classes and embody that. So everyone needs to be involved and on top of the most at-risk kids. Um, it shouldn't take parents coming before school board, literally crying. I've seen a couple of parents crying um, and it usually goes back to IEPs and 504s. And what is that? Um, For those who don't know. Um, thank you. An IEP is an um, individualized education plan. So the example I give for my daughter, she has one for speech services. A 504 is any medical um, it's medical documentation. So my son has one. And um, if that ne necessitates um, accommodations, then there would be a 504 plan. And they are federally protected. Um, there's so many there are parental rights involved, but I don't even know that I would know those parental rights had I not studied education myself. So, you know, asking me earlier why I'm here is activism, trying to inform the community, especially for those, again, most at risk, you know, parents who may not have graduated, who may not have gone on to um, university or anything and aren't aware of the rights they have for their kids and the services that are offered. Amy, as principal at Southport, uh, the families within our school knew that I had open door policy all the time. My door was open, literally. And if they needed to talk to me, they just came back, came to the secretary and they would see me in just a minute. If I was at bus duty, they called me on the, on the phone and said, uh, there's a parent to see you. I said, well, as soon as we get through announcements, uh, I will be there. I always saw them. In fact, I have gone to school at night and met with parents. And we're talking about IEPs. Certainly, I don't know how many IEP meetings I've set in on many, many, many. And they're so important. That's federal money. And, you know, they, federal people are watching us very carefully and making sure we're doing right with IEPs. You know, the important thing is you've got to follow the IEP. You meet early in the year, and then towards the end of the year, you look and say, well, how successful were we? Were we really successful with this child? We hope we were. All right. We all know there's a shortage of teachers around the country, around the state, uh, but especially here in the panhandle. What are you doing or would you like to do uh, to attract more educators? Okay. Well, I think uh, right now in our schools that we're having difficulty with, we're attracting teachers because we're giving them more money. Uh, in these schools. We need them in these schools because we're having difficulties. And we've been successful. I'm so proud. 
uh, that they have come. And, you know, our grades this year uh, were excellent. Uh, I'm not going to say I'm not going to crow about them being great, but we we didn't have any to go down and we had a, a lot to go up. And uh, we we're really close to almost making an A, three points away. So it's very important, uh, as I've said, that, for us to do that. Do you know what the shortage is right now in Bay County? Uh, no, just the other day, though, I think HR told me that we still had openings for like 30 uh, teachers. District-wide. You know, it's really changed. Amy, when I had like a third grade opening at Southport many years ago, we had so many uh, teacher candidates at that time. By school board policy, you had to interview five people. We interviewed 10. And I'd have my people for third grade, all my teachers come in, we interviewed them. It's just changed. i tell you what's happened is a lot of our ki kids, I call them kids, young people in college just haven't gone in the area of education, teaching. And we can do everything we can, but if we don't have the people to pick from, we just don't. And hey, a problem we really have is in the substitute area. And uh, we try our best. We give them a little stipend for being there for, or five, you know, so many uh, days in a row, et cetera. So we're trying. It's difficult, not only here, but nationwide. How do you feel about that? Yeah, no, to build off that, it is a nationwide problem. So I mentioned earlier, I, I went to a Title I school, and I was saying about this the other night when I was Title I. Case. I'm sorry. That's so okay. <laughs> um, we have students underperforming, living in poverty. The school is. Basically, what we're seeing is turnaround schools here, the CSNI schools here. So um, when I, th I was, you know, should have been asleep, but my brain's like going, I'm thinking about my teachers and I'm like, wow, I had like veteran teachers. I mean, like they aged out. Um, there was no turnover. I mean, to my knowledge, there was no incentive to keep doing it. It was just, it's what they did. So to kind of piggyback off something Mr. Register said when I was in high school, I remember telling my 10th grade English teacher, I want to be a teacher. And she said, no, you don't. You're too smart. Don't do that. So... That is a problem for what he just said, having kids, students go to college because I did. I went in as nuclear net medicine. And I was like, what am I doing? This isn't this isn't this isn't going to work. I don't like needles. So I routed back up to where I believe I was always meant to be. But if I can under I, I as a, a parent and an educator, I can feel that distress where you want to warn them that, hey, the cost of living is high here and the pay isn't great. And if you want a family, if you want to be able to sit, live comfortably, maybe you should do something else. So we need to start swapping that, that narrative. And even if, you know, maybe the increase in pay isn't here right now, however, we can get just a rock star school system from the admin to the support team to just everybody. So everyone's like, all right, I, I, I could make more, but I love going to work. And I really think that will start to change that to, you know, the soon to be graduates who do have an interest in teaching and learning. So we can kind of halt that where it is and start recruiting them. Now, are you an educator? It says so on your campaign bio, one mm -hmm. of the things that I read. Yes. Um, I'm licensed secondary English and social studies. I have um, SOEs in other areas. I have a graduate certificate um, in TESOL, teaching English to second language learners. Um, I absolutely loved doing that program and working with the WIDA standards because um, that can apply to any intervention, any any student who needs extra intervention. Um, I have enough credentials to also be licensed to teach science um, and humanities in Florida. All right, but you don't teach now. I, no, I didn't teach last year due to medical issues, and I am teaching for Arizona Virtual this year. All right. You, you know, uh, I'm very proud of all our employees. It takes a team effort. It's a team of teams we talk about, and uh, this is so important. Let me say something about teachers. I have been, I've been knowing so many wonderful teachers all these years. I had great teachers at Southport. I loved them. I supported them. They supported our children, and. Uh, with uh, with people like in maintenance and with people in the bus uh, area and then people at the media center and then the people at the county office, all of us together, the team of teams, we have to work together to be successful because, you know, if we can put the uh, A back in Bay, that's what it takes. We talked about the military. Your husband's retired. You've been in this district a long time, so you understand the uh, relationship there. 
Um, what can Bay District do, though, to make it even better for the military family? We have Tyndall Academy out on Tyndall Air Force Base, which is a Bay District school. Um, but is there more we can do to help military families or children whose parents are deployed? And we'll start with you, Ms. Nieves. Yes. Uh, one thing I want to hit on is the EOCs. I've kind of been an advocate and routing people in the right direction. You know, they kids are being uprooted in the middle of uh, high school and they're coming in. They're like, you know, one example is, hey, I, I took this geography EOC and they're saying, no, you have to redo our EOC. While we have um, friends over in Eglin who Eglin just takes it. They're like, oh, OK, yeah, we'll accept it. It's like unintentionally, obviously, uh, Bay County's it's too difficult for military students. A lot of parents opt to homeschool then have to deal with this. Um, military families, you mean? What did I say? Uh, military. No, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Military gonna, families. Yeah, I didn't know if I misspoke. Yeah, no. um, they they do. They opt to homeschool their kids to avoid having, you know, the headache of the curriculum trans or yeah, the credit transfer. So for myself, when I talk about my own children, um, my son came in with a gifted plan from Virginia and by Florida statute, it's a transfer plan. And instead I, you know, get a lot of kickback like, oh, well, we don't recognize a test that he took. And I said this earlier, a lot of parents aren't also educators and they don't know the statutes and they aren't aware that, well, this is actually how it's supposed to work. You accept it and then you reevaluate from there. And again, same situation, um, same school. We we're, were lucky enough to have some friends move right after we moved, but they just accepted it like it was nothing, incorporated it. It's, it's the amount of unnecessary stress that's being added on these military kids that needs to be alleviated. But are some of those guidelines state and not district? What do you mean? Can you elaborate? We're like, we're like you said, um, things won't transfer. No, no. So they, they do end up transferring. Um, there's a couple contacts that I've got into eventually. And um, just for the sake of my own kid, because he took biology in middle school, and that was something that was going back and forth. Well, he has to have the EOC to graduate. No, he doesn't. He would need it to get the cord if he wanted to um, go that route. But there is a, con a point of contact who I finally you know got, and I kind of share her information out there. Um, because at the end of the day, no, they, they will accept the out-of-state EOCs. It's just you have two neighboring counties, and one is – more stressful to I don't know to move, to transfer into at least in, in secondary um, and as for you know the gifted plan that I had mentioned no that's that's Florida statute you accept the plan you accept the IEP the 504 plans you accept them because they're transfer plans Mr. Register yeah we have identified uh, <laughs> many of our schools as military schools in fact we're adding uh, the rest of them this school year. Plus, I think the superintendent talked to me the other day and said that we're adding uh, Gulf Coast State College and we're adding the Florida State campus here as a military school. And, you know, uh, although we have treated our military folks well, because we know it's so important for us having our two bases. And uh, uh, we've, we've seen the military kids at uh, our school board meetings. We have identified them. We have said some great things about them, and uh, we do appreciate them. Let's talk about the budget. $672 million. Mm -hmm. um, are you in favor of raising the millage rate to increase the budget now or at all in the future? Do you think that's something that would be necessary? Ms. Nieves. I find from my own personal philosophies and my bleeding heart, as my husband says, I am okay with paying a little bit more with the reassurance that it is being – is fiscally being, you know, it's, it's being used responsibly, fiscally, um, for teacher salaries, for improvements, anything along the way. That is something I am willing as a person to vote for. Yes. That's a great question. I'm so glad you asked that. <laughs> I promised our people in Bay County, if they would vote for the half cent sales tax, I would never, never vote for additional ad valorem tax. That's tax on property. Our people have done so well in that area with uh, uh, leading to the half-cent sales tax. Let me tell you, one month, about two years ago, we had we collected $8 million. If we hadn't had the half-cent sales tax after the hurricane, we would have been in dramatic problem. Our people in Bay County do not need another tax. They do not need an additional ad valorem tax. The best way to get money in our schools is through the half cents because people who come in to the beaches, people who visit here, people who go through here, buy groceries, this, that, and the other, we are 
paying that half cents at that time, and we really don't understand it. People who have homes, by the way, we have our ad valorem tax has gone just like this the last 10 years. It has not gone up, and I'm so proud of that. That's one promise I made, the only one, really, to the taxpayers of Bay County. How do you feel about that half penny that we pay? No, I'm, okay. I'm fine with the half You're cent tax. Now. I am. Okay. Yeah, I'm totally fine. Um, I mean, I donate to enough causes anyway. It's just obviously, no, people struggle, right? We, we don't want to see anything massive go through. But me as a voter, I'm not, you know, as an individual, if, if, that, if I were to have been here to vote for that, I would be okay with knowing that my kids would receive um, – a better quality of education in in return because their teachers are being compensated because we're recruiting and retaining. That's, I don't know, that's my, my thoughts on that, but okay. yeah. Law enforcement is a daily part of our lives now, especially with mm-hmm. school shootings happening around the country in recent years. Bay County has opted into a <clears throat> program that allows teachers and administrators to secretly carry a weapon in case of an emergency. They go through a very rigid program to train to be as proficient as a police officer are you for or against this program and why it's the guardian program it's wonderful not just anyone gets in it i mean they go through scrutiny to get into the program they have many 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 hours to uh, have to sit through and study and do this that and the other i have been on many campuses i'm there all the time you never know who has a gun but I know in my heart of hearts that I know someone does that it may keep from someone being hurt because of them having a gun. I am for it and I will always be. How do you feel about that program? I hate that I have to say that I support it, if that makes sense. You know, as a parent, especially when we, you know, we look at the, the Uvalde, um, Texas shooting, had someone been able to minimize that effect, had someone had the guardian plan been in effect at that school, it could have saved so many lives. So obviously I think we all hate that it's had to come to this, but I feel better as a parent sending my children to school, knowing that there is someone who could save my life if my life was in danger or as a teacher or my children's. Amy, if I could just say a couple of things, my life was changed in uh, 2010. That was the, you might remember Amy, the, horrific shooting at the school board office that scared me so bad my life has been changed (laughs) i thought i've followed the golden rule but i may do more sort of now than ever before but you know if someone had had a gun that day and thank god that uh mike jones came in and probably saved us but that goes along you know since our society is where it is by the way since the since the shooting After that, there were more shootings everywhere throughout the country, and uh, what a difficult time we have. And it's my prayer all the time that, you know, none of our kids get hurt because of that. Are you familiar that we had a school board shooting? Yes, yeah, I learned about that when we moved here. Um, I I believe that's what prompted the uh, parent comments to have to be requested and not to be fed, um, life fed through through the meetings, and that's atrocious that's that's horrible and i'm sorry you had to go through that um i can't imagine what i would have done but yeah no i mean you think about these things and then i'm i'm pretty sure that if i were to live it i would be like a squirrel and freeze on the spot so having somebody trained to remediate that in the schools and to save kids and to save staff i support that bay district schools has a new motto put the a back in bay is that just a slogan and if if you believe it how can we accomplish that and quickly, not having to wait another five or 10 years. Mr. Register. Well, Amy, we're very close to having an A now. Uh, I've been thinking about this some, but you know, I think I've tried to put an A in Bay for a long, long time, not just right now, but this is a movement. Hey, I went to last week, I went in service with teachers, and this week I went to the beginning on Monday. I have never seen our teachers more excited about putting an A in Bay. You know why I think? I, there was one quote made, thanks for proving what is possible. They found out last year it is possible to make it a good grade. Now they are, are incited into the fact that, oh, we can do, we did that. We can do even more this next year. And it's not a slogan. You know, we talk about academics. We talk about accountability. We talk about attendance. We talk about arts and athletics. It's the whole scope. 
the team of teams, we are trying to put an A back in Bay. We're really close. And there were so many great things that we heard about. Let me give you an example. Walsenham Elementary Academy, I think we call it now, they missed an A by .05, five hundreds, five hundreds, that close. Our district is coming forward, and I am so proud of all of them, all those folks. How do you feel about that? No, I don't. I don't think it's just a slogan. Um, it is a movement. It incorporates a lot. I love that all the high schools, for example, offer something different, tailored, unique, educational. Um, uh, the what's the word I'm looking for? Well, educational sports, different um, things for students to do. I would like to see that transcend into the elementary schools, into the middle schools, to get the middle school maybe a little more hands-on, um, trade ready. Um, when we talk about putting the A back in Bay, I recognize that we have a high graduation rate, and that is amazing. But there are some components or some policies I'm not fond of. Um, as a teacher, I'm not personally fond of uh, you can't give anything lower than a 50 percent. I understand that it's easier to get a child from a, you know, to pull them up from a 50 child student in general. But if a student even has a five or 15 percent and they're willing to show that I've I've never met a teacher or an admin who won't help them in return get to their very best. But I think if we say, hey, we can't give you anything less than 50 percent, we're setting these graduates up for failure in the real life, whether it's academia, it's trade school, it's the workforce, it's military. There are there are components of this putting a back into bay that I think should be honed in on a little more than the others and not just looking at the school girl, uh, school grade overall. Amy, if you just let me say one thing, the CTE program we're here, career technical education. We have so many things going on where people are getting certification. For instance, like at Bozeman, we're talking about at Rutherford, we're talking about out at Arnold. There, and of course, I better not forget about uh, Tom Haney. Uh, So many certifications uh, our students are accomplishing. Not everybody is going to college. Not everybody has the ability to do so. But you know, they could become a welder and make more money than me. And there are people who could be a bricklayer and make more than me. I'm so proud of that. Our CTE program, I would say, in the last two to three years has been unbelievable. I'm so proud. Any other comments? Yeah, that's what I was um, getting at. I would like to see that coming down and trickling into middle school. So, you know, these kids can get an idea. Oh, I really like that. And then maybe even already have some of the credit or some of the experience or that wasn't for me. And then go into a different trade in high school. Yeah, I do agree with you. But I'll tell you. Our expenditures is unbelievable. Uh, Amy, we, you mentioned a while ago, our budget this year is $672 million, And over 70% goes for salaries and benefits. And we have so much that we deal with, and then we have so little in, in unappropriated monies that we don't spend. And it's difficult. And, you know, I'd like to do every program possible, but we just can't. How many of these have you done? How many forms? Seven in the last few weeks? I don't, I don't know. 55? No, uh, feels like that. <laughs> You've five, done a lot. Maybe five, six. Is there one question, even tonight, that hasn't been asked that you just wish somebody would have asked you as a candidate for a school board? We'll start with you, Mr. Register. Is there something that you, a subject, an issue that you said, why didn't they just yeah. ask that? Well, I can't really say truthfully they haven't, but it's been kind of muffled. Uh, banning of books, and I don't call it really banning because I think we're taking them off the shelf, okay? Uh, in the last uh, t- uh, 20 years, we've only banned one book, and probably there have probably been some more should have been. Do you know which one it was? Do you remember? Uh, Ace of Spades. Okay, was I'm right. I, I, I can't okay. remember. <laughs> yeah, I think I'm right. Remember. But anyway, okay. I think it was. Okay. But uh, it came before us last year, and we took it off the shelf. And let me just go f- a little bit further. Schools should not have pornography. Bottom line, no por- pornography. If parents want their children to have pornography, they can go to the library. They can go somewhere else to find those books. But I don't think our schools have a place for pornography because, you know, 
We have to be the mom and daddy at school. We have to take care of them at school. We are the mom and dad at school. So, uh, you know, someone told me this week, said, Jerry, look, betting, you tell people what they can or can't not do. No, I'm taking the book off the shelf. I'm not telling them what they can't do, but I've took that book off the shelf so that one child or some other child will not pick that book up and read it. Is there anything you wish people had asked? Um, well, I want to go off that. I, I agree. You shouldn't have um, any pornography, pornographic material in schools. Um, and that's that also comes down from legislation. I did want to add that while one was removed, um, 34 were weeded from school libraries after formal objection was submitted. This appears. Um, yeah. So there were more. And I, I have I'm not going to click that look the list, but, there, you know, there were more. Um so I'm on board with everything Bay County, in Bay well. County. Yeah. So I'm, I'm totally on board with everything he said. Um, I'm all about letting kids read whatever's going to get them reading, because even if it's a comics, it's going to make those neurological connections. It's going to improve their reading comprehension, their vocabulary, et cetera, et cetera. But we don't need derogatory material in, in the classroom. Um, for me, you know, that's funny because this question was asked at Kiwanis and I couldn't come up with anything. And then right when I left, I was like, oh, that was it. And I lost it again. <laughs> but one thing is safety, a mental health safety. So I guess a question of how I feel about it or how we could target it. So I, I know there's initiatives, even with uh, Miss uh, Lady, Lady DeSanta, the, the governor's wife, uh, to promote mental health awareness um, throughout our schools. But it is probably top priority up there with increasing literacy levels. Um, I mentioned my degrees earlier. One of them's in um, master's in public health and just the amount of data that is constantly coming out about on one hand, we have an increase in mental health awareness, but on the other hand, we have an even more rapid increase in mental health diagnosis. And this, this is the problem. You have the kids on social media, on Instagram, on TikTok, and they're like, this is how my life should be. This is what I should look like. As if being a teenager isn't hard enough. I don't think... Phones should be in school. Okay, I do. I do think phones should be in school in the sense that they're put away because if there's an emergency, I know it's going to make my son feel better. It's going to make me feel better if he's like, hey, I'm safe, right? In the classroom, put it out of sight, put it out of mind. Um, but the reality is that, I've, you know, I've seen kindergartners with phones, kindergartners. There's no way I'm going to give my kindergartner a phone. So that's up to the parents, what they choose to do. But it all, I mean, I mentioned the community earlier, all these problems feed back into the classroom. We really need to be pouring support into mental health and into just reality of it, like the reality of life, like bringing kids back away from social media and back into the reality and getting that holistic, you know, kicking beanbag, not beanbags, what are they called? The little hacky sacks, you know, in the lunchroom before school again, instead of just on their phone. I mean, the... Every it's like every two years you look at the data, it's worse and it's worse. And there's a direct correlation between the phones. All right. Well, I appreciate both of you coming out. Thank you. I've Thank run out you. of questions and you uh, filled the void there at the end. So I appreciate that a lot. <laughs> Thank you. Um, it's time for closing statements. And Mr. Register, we'll start with you. Well, thank you so much. I, I've really enjoyed tonight. I really have. Uh, I want to talk about some things that uh, I have stood up. For for example, uh, Callaway Elementary was going to be closed, and I talked to the folks at Tyndall and the Military Affairs Committee, and I led a contingent, and uh, we didn't close it. I made the motion to do that. Same thing at West Bay. Uh, when we closed and repurposed schools, uh, we closed uh, West Bay, and I told those people there, we're going to open it up when we need the seats, and guess what? I led a charge. It was 5 0. We uh, opened that school back up. Hey, people, you know me. I'm a Christian guy. I'm a family person. I'm hardworking. I'm a sportsman. And I know the pulse of the community. I have enjoyed and I have been blessed to be part of education in Bay County almost 50 years. Thank you. Right. Turn. Yeah, I can't reiterate enough how much I appreciate your dedication to education, everyone who's done it this long. Um, and there's never been a doubt in my mind when you say, you know, you're, you're the best principal and your teachers loved you. I believe that wholeheartedly. So when people ask me why I'm doing this, it's times times change. Um, I have one grandparent, and this isn't toward, toward anything, who are adamant that, no, they don't. 
um, stick to arithmetic and reading. And my, my another grandparent who's like, no, you know, they do. We, I wish it could be as cut, cut and dry as it's about arithmetic and reading. But the more that we learn through like educational like pedagogy and, and, and we see that that's like the art of, the art of teaching, um, we see just how much the community factors in to how students are going to succeed. The sooner we really realize that and grapple with it, um, I think the better everyone's everyone's going to do. Um, I've tried, I think I mentioned this, or I did, I mentioned this earlier. I tried to dodge education and the universe just keeps bringing me back to it. Um, from my personal upbringing, someone close to me told me that I should have been a statistic. Um, and it kind of hurt, but it was like, it was really true thinking of my upbringing. And she was like, you should have been a statistic about 10 times over, but instead I'm a college graduate 10 times over. And I've seen the demographics. I've seen, I've heard the cries for help and throughout the county. And I really just want to advocate for these kids so they do not become that statistic and to just show them you can be whatever you want to be. And if you want to be 32 at a news station talking about helping more kids when that was not on your bingo card for the year, you can do that too. All right. Whitney Nieves and Jerry Register. Thank you. Thank you both for coming out tonight. We appreciate your candor this evening. And we do want to remind everybody that early voting is underway, but it does go through the 17th. I believe there are eight sites around the county, so you can pick the one closest to you and go and vote. I believe they're open from 10 to 6, again, through August 17th. You can go to bayvotes.org, where Nina Ward, our new supervisor of elections, has all the information there because I've checked. If you wait to vote on Election Day, August 20th, uh, it's 7 to 7 at your precinct. And I mentioned this at the last debate debate that my precinct personally had changed from over the years when I got my sample ballot. So double check. So if you wait till the 20th, you know where to go and there's no kerfuffle with you getting in to vote. We appreciate everybody. We will have all the election results, of course, on August 20th here on News 13. So we invite you to stay tuned and we thank you again for watching. We'll see you next time.